Um, I'm Philip Zarian in the History Department. Thank you for coming to this lecture by J.H. Plum. The uh, lecture is sponsored by the ISU. No, it doesn't work. No, up. The lecture is sponsored by the ISU Committee on Lectures, the Department of History, and the Department of History Honorary Phi Alpha Theta. J.H. Plum is an extraordinary historian, one of the finest historians in British history in this century. His reputation rests not only upon his impressive list of contributions to the literature of history, but also to the training he gives to his students to his concern for the discipline of history and 20th century culture, to the simply elegant prose with which he shapes the characters and events of the past for our minds and our imaginations. He's retired now from active work, university work at Cambridge, but I should like to give you something of his background and mention a few of his accomplishments. Mr. Plum comes from Leicester, England and was educated there and at the University of London. He then went on to Cambridge, where he studied under another of England's great historical scholars, G.M. Trevelyan. There, he received his PhD. During the Second World War, he worked for intelligence at the Foreign Office, and then returned to Christ College, Cambridge, where he was lecturer, then reader, and finally professor of modern English history. He has also served as chairman of the Faculty at, of History at Cambridge. Mr. Plum is a peripatetic scholar and has recently spent considerable time in America as lecturer and visiting historian at Columbia, at the City University of New York, at Minnesota, and he has held a chair at Texas Christian University. When it comes to publications, the list is so extraordinarily long that I shall only mention a few. He has written England in the 18th century as a part of the Pelican history of England. Chatham, a brief biography of William Pitt, the elder. The first four Georges, a study of Britain's early Hanoverian kings. The Renaissance, a volume in the his horizon history of Europe. And a considerable series of essays on various topics in England's historical past, all brought forth, of course, in marvelous prose. Perhaps his most enduring achievement is a definitive biography of Sir Robert Walpole, an 18th century politician who, because of Mr. Plum's meticulous scholarship, we now recognize as one of the most influential figures in modern British history. One of John Plum's greatest honors, at least as far as the discipline of history is concerned, was the invitation to him to present the Ford Lectures at Oxford in 1966. They were the most prestigious lectures in the entire field of British history and were later published in a superb book as The Growth of Political Stability in England, 1675 to 1725. These lectures are fundamental to an understanding of modern British politics. Along with these scholarly achievements, Mr. Plum has generously, has given generously to his profession by way of articles in historical journals and book reviews for periodicals on both sides of the Atlantic. And he is editor of three series of studies in history and biography. Many Americans will remember his columns in the Saturday Review. He is a fellow of the British Academy, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and is associated with other learned and professional societies. C.P. Snow has written of him, creative energy is one of Professor Plum's most obvious gifts. Another is his sense of reality. No other historian can convey so vividly the feeling of how men breathe, eat, breed, enjoy themselves, go about their business, hope, worry, and die. Another friend, Neil McKendrick, has written, where the world is divided into those who detract from life and those who enhance it, Jack Plum invariably comes out high and among the life enhancers, and this is a rare and valuable attribute among contemporary historians. <laughs> 
Well, I might say a good deal more about Mr. Plum's accomplishments, but instead let me conclude by saying to you that uh, the title of Mr. Plum's lecture is The Impact of the American Revolution on Britain. Mr. Plum, it's a great honor to have you here at Iowa State University. We'll welcome you and we're eager to hear what you have to say. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> Jay Plum. After such enconiums, I think the only thing really to do is to bow and retire. <laughs> but I try and live up to at least uh, a tenth of them. If I do that, I should do well. Now, I want to speak tonight about the effect and the enduring effects of the American Revolution on my country. Not only do I want to bring out the great changes which it made in the structure of the British Empire and British society, but I also want to recall to you uh, some of the effects that it had on ordinary men and women. I think one should always start in any discussion with the lives of individuals. We tend to forget that the revolution, when times of revolution occur, then ordinary men and women have to take decisions which may not only affect them, uh, but their children and their children's children right down through the generations. It was only rarely in the late 19th century that American historians began to realize that a vast number of Americans who had not agreed with the revolution, had been almost destroyed by it, had had to pick up their bags and their belongings, and go to the less hospitable shores of Nova Scotia or the, even the less hospitable shore, uh, lands of Ontario. But now, of course, the patriots, the loyalists, are well studied, one knows a great deal about them. Indeed, every year one finds yet another book about them. But we tend to forget that there are also English people whose lives were changed, in some ways destroyed, by sympathy for your cause. Let me give you an example. One, Jonathan Shipley. Jonathan Shipley was a well-to-do young man of good gentry family. He was a friend of Benjamin Franklin, but he'd be no way indeed radicalized by Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin had enjoyed his hospitality in the, in the country, uh, but they had not a great deal of sympathy of ideas at that time. What radicalized Jonathan Shipley was not even the American cause to start with. It was the treatment of Indians in India, particularly Bengalese, by the British. He thought they were being destroyed, and millions of them were being destroyed, by an unjust and extortionist system of taxation. Having been radicalized by India, he naturally turned his attention to the plight of the colonists and in 1774 made a most trenchant speech in the House of Lords on behalf of America. By this time, he had become a Welsh bishop. Now, if you became a Welsh bishop in the 18th century, you didn't expect and certainly you didn't hope to spend the rest of your life in Wales. You looked forward, your eyes were set on the distant horizons of York, Winchester, Salisbury, and the like. Jonathan Shipley, because of that speech and because of the pamphlet that he afterwards printed, remained a Welsh bishop for the rest of his life. <laughs> his career was ended at 29. And he was not alone. Take the Earl of Pembroke. Now, Lord Pembroke was one of the most prestigious of all noblemen, certainly in the county of Wiltshire. You may, for a considerable fee, still visit his house there. It is one of the most beautiful in, in, of 18th century houses in the country. And he was Lord Lieutenant, of course, of Wiltshire, which meant that he was the King's representative there. He was also a colonel in one of England's greatest regiments, the Royals. And indeed, he had the most singular honor, that is, he had the right to hold the king's shirt in the morning when he got up. Not, of course, that the king ever put that shirt on, 
It was merely an emblematic gesture, heraldic gesture, if you like. The king nodded towards the shirt and then proceeded to get into the one which he normally wore. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was an honor that was keenly sought after by all the aristocrats of England in the reign of George III. But in 1778, Pembroke had had enough. He wrote to his son, his illegitimate son, who was over here fighting for the British, I wish I was a Laplander or anything but a Briton. Why? And he said why to his son. That Parliament was corrupt, that the George III was incurably stupid, that Lord North's policy was disastrous, that the army in America was doomed to defeat. And indeed, he saw no possibility of victory. And so he said, if England, if Englishmen had any sense, and if the Londoners had any sense, they'd nail up the doors of the House of Parliament and set fire to them. As you see, even though he was a member of the House of Lords, he had become irate and enraged uh, by the situation in America. Naturally, Lord Pembroke never held the King's shirt again. Nor was he ever Lord Lieutenant for another year, and he was quickly removed from his colonelcy in the Royals. His career, too, came to an end at that point. By then, by 1778-9, English society was riven. As with the war in Vietnam, in this country, so with Britain at the time of the American Revolution. It divided artisan from artisan, merchant from merchant, gentleman from gentleman, aristocrat from aristocrat, bishop from bishop. Family themselves were divided. And surprisingly, even the royal family was divided. Even there, brother was divided against brother. George III and his brother, the Duke of Gloucester, were at loggerheads. And because they were at loggerheads, it leads us to one of the most singular dinner parties ever held in 18th century Europe. It was a dinner party held in Metz on the borders of uh, Belgium and France. And in August 1775, a great coach lumbered into the courtyard of the military governor, uh, who was the Comte de Broglie, and he was waiting on the steps to receive no other than George III's brother, the Duke of Gloucester. Now, why was the Duke of Gloucester in France at that moment? Well, for a variety of reasons. He had married imprudently, very imprudently. So imprudently that the Royal Marriages Act was passed uh, so that no member of the royal family, even now, can marry without the consent of the sovereign. So, as you may expect, his marriage was very imprudent indeed. <laughs> He'd married the bastard daughter of Sir Edward Walpole, uh, the son of the Prime Minister. Not a thing for a Royal Highness to do. <laughs> that was one black mark. He had another. As young princes were wont to do in the 18th century, he got outrageously, monstrously in debt. Now, that might possibly have been overlooked even his marriage might, in the end, have been, perhaps, an accommodation might have been made with it. But worse than this, Gloucester had become an ardent supporter of the radical John Wilkes, whom George III detested, who had caused so much trouble for, for the king at the time of the Stamp Act. Uh, and furthermore, he'd become deeply uh, sympathetic uh, with the cause of the American colonists. And so, it was thought best if Gloucester should develop poor health and go to Italy for a year or two uh, for the sake of it. And that's what was exactly happening at that point. He was on the way with his unwelcome wife for the winter in Rome. And on the way there, he'd been invited by de Broglie uh, to stay with him and to dine with him. Because de Broglie was fascinated by what was happening. Now, who was de Broglie, and why was he fascinated with Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester? For this simple reason, that de Broglie was, in a sense, in semi-disgrace 
because he was one of the great French generals who had been defeated by the English in the Seven Years' War. And naturally, he was longing for revenge. And naturally, since 1763, when the Treaty of Paris had been signed, he'd been watching England with care, hoping that the difficulties about Wilkes, difficulties about the Stamp Act, uh, would gradually lead to confusion, dissension, and civil strife in England itself. And so he wanted to cross-question Gloucester about the condition in England. Actually, many years later, an old man pretended that he had done the cross-examining of Gloucester on that occasion. By then, Lafayette, who was 82 years of age, and we only really know about this dinner party, at least we first knew about this dinner party, because Lafayette talked to Jared Sparks about it when Sparks was writing The Life of Washington. But now we know far more about it from Horace Walpole's correspondence and elsewhere. Uh, but w w when Lafayette recalled the dinner, he said that he cross-examined Gloucester. And when he heard from Gloucester's lips how badly you were being treated, how desperately freedom was being trod underfoot in this country, that his heart burned to serve you, uh, to come over here in the cause of liberty. Now, nothing I think is more unlikely than an exceedingly young-looking 18-year-old would have cross-examined in the presence of his distinguished relative, de Broglie, a royal brother from England. Almost certainly he listened, and no doubt he may easily, and certainly his imagination was fired. But at that moment, undoubtedly, it was de Broglie who was doing the cross-examination. And what they both heard, however, was sweet music. Because Gloucester, like so many of the radical chic, always, in all countries, in all times, and this is true of you today, as it was of uh, Gloucester in the 18th century, uh, exaggerated, of course, uh, the situation in the favor of his own views and his own ideas. Yes, he said, England was in trouble. It was, he thought, sliding. Uh, towards a real crisis of the dimensions possibly of that of 1641. Maybe England was even going to slide into civil war. What sweeter music could de Broglie have heard than that? Because he felt that because of the defeat in the Seven Years' War, France was becoming a cipher in Europe. That's what he'd written to his monarch. That, England, that France was becoming a cipher. Because in the Treaty of Paris, that had lost, as you know, Canada, lost the possibility, it seemed, of a Mississippian empire. It had also, was in a very tenuous position in India, and it had received great defeats in Europe itself. And of course, therefore, de Broglie wished to recover, if possible, the position of France in the world. And he thought this might be a golden opportunity for doing so. And so he immediately wrote and put pressure on the foreign ministry to get aid to the American colonies, support for them uh, in their struggle, if it should come uh, to a shooting war. On the other hand, of course, de Broglie was also too sharp-minded a man to rely entirely on Gloucester. Was what he said really true? This, of course, again worried the French Foreign Office. They were moved by what Gloucester had said, but could you really depend on it? So, what do you do in these circumstances? When there are troubled waters in which you want to fish, possibly for your own advantage, in any case to cause difficulties to your enemy, what do you do there? you send in, of course, the CIA, which is exactly, of course, uh, what the French did. They activated their agents in England and sent in one new one. And I must say, both of them were worthy of the imagination of Howard Hunt. <laughs> one was the Chevalier Dayon, who lived so successfully as a woman for 35 years that it required a medical autopsy after his death to discover exactly what he was. 
And the other was Beaumarchais, the creator of Figaro, whose imagination in politics was as startling as that in imaginative literature. So they were activated. They both had very good contacts in England. And indeed, as agents are wont to do, they wished to please their masters. And the evidence they read in a way which would give pleasure to the French Foreign Office. And so the reports that came back were not quite so glowing as the one that Gloucester gave, but nevertheless they were that, yes, trouble was mounting in England, uh, Lord North's ministry was in difficulties, and undoubtedly this was a golden opportunity for France. Well, they didn't quite convince. Louis XVI, who had just come to the throne, was slow, he was vacillating, he preferred taking clocks to pieces and putting them together again, rather than some of the more onerous tasks of monarchy, like begetting heirs. <laughs> but he was in no way stupid, in no way stupid. And he realized his dilemma. Was it right, was it proper to support people revolting against their monarch. The Americans talk not only in terms of liberty, but in terms of equality. Was it prudent for an hereditary monarch to support such people? But then on the other hand, might not Canada be regained? Might not the French position in India be strengthened? Might not a fresh, profitable sugar island be captured in the Caribbean. So what do you do in those circumstances? Well, you all know what you do in those circumstances. You've sent in the CIA. Now you send in the military advisors. And those hot-headed mercenaries and loyalists, whom, of course, you can't keep from going. And this, of course, is exactly what happened in 1776. The tough professionals come in, people like de Kalb, who oddly enough was at the dinner party too in Metz, who had already reconnoitred the American scene for the French government and given quite a different point of view uh, to that of Gloucester or de Broglie or Deon. He thought that the Americans were not material out of which you made armies. Uh, he pointed out that financially they had no money at all. The dollar was pretty well worthless. Uh, that's a change, isn't it? And <laughs> also, that, of course, you had no engineers, no real capacity to make arms. And so his report had been a very gloomy one. And nevertheless, he was persuaded by Laf Lafayette to accompany him. And France decided to do what it could uh, to help America. Now, as you see, short of war, as you see, already from the very first shot, at Lexington and Concord. This had ceased to be the Civil War, which is the way most Englishmen regarded it initially, between Americans and English. They didn't regard it as colonial revolt, because they regarded Pennsylvania and Philadelphia and New York and Boston as an integral part of British society. But right from the moment the, those first guns went off, the American situation became a part of a global struggle, not merely a revolt of the American plantations against the mother country. It was never purely that and never could be. Right from the very start, your struggle involved Britain in a new global war of very large dimension, and that was the first great impact that your revolt had on the English scene. Now, what happened, I'll quickly pass over. As you know, Beaumarchais's vigorous imagination was not at a loss when it came to sending you arms illicitly from France and Spain. Indeed, his scheme was worthy of Figaro. What did he do? He borrowed two million livres from the French government, and then with their own money, bought guns and gunpowder and armament out of the French arsenals. 
That is, he got the money from the French treasury to buy their own armaments <laughs> and then ship them across the Atlantic, not to give them to you, but to sell them to you. <laughs> but, after all, Congress had no money, and also they weren't uncanny either. They were very canny. And it took, not Beaumarchais, but his family, some 35 years to get his debt settled with Congress. <laughs> and the present uh, Marquis de Beaumarchais, the present um, French ambassador in London, told me with a very gloomy face that the family, in actual fact, had never made a sou uh, out of that particular deal. <laughs> but I think the imagination of the family still persists. <laughs> I can't believe that they would live in such splendor unless something had trickled across the Atlantic by some means or the other. However, the money came across, de Kalb came across, mercenaries like Deux-Pont with his armies came across, and finally, after Valley Forge, which impressed the tough de Kalb, the first time he was really impressed by Washington and the American army, persuaded Louis to enter the war in really a big way. And he sent, as you know, Rochambeau, very good, professional, well-organized, admirable army. And with their help, you manage to achieve independence. But without the French connection, it's very doubtful indeed uh, whether you'd have achieved it so soon, because of the, you would not have had the miracle of Yorktown. The miracle of Yorktown, I repeat, the miracle of Yorktown. And miracle it was, why? Can you imagine, in the circumstances of the 18th century, in a world of sailing ships and marching, slow marching armies, that two French navies should have rendezvoused from 3,000 miles apart at a time when they only had a few weeks in which they could rendezvous off the Chesapeake. Again, Rochambeau and Washington, in spite of Washington's mistaken attempt to get New York, which Rochambeau thought was stupid beyond belief, nevertheless, those two armies managed to, to get to Yorktown along with the Navy. The logistics are fantastic. Only a miracle really could have brought them about. And of course, without Rochambeau being there, and without de Grasse being there, Yorktown was most unlikely ever to have fallen. So, you, you see, too, were a part of that global situation, a part of the conflict between France and, Sp and England, which was already 100 years old or more by 1776. And, of course, France had made certain that it wasn't merely going to be a struggle between America and France on the one side and England on the other. It had, the French government had used extraordinary skill to detach Britain's oldest allies from her support, namely the Dutch, who, because of their very considerable investments in Pennsylvania and in land speculation beyond the Alleghenies, uh, was willing to go along, first of all, to be neutral, and then to declare war on Britain. As well as the Dutch, of course, England had brought, uh, France had brought in Spain, dangling before her uh, the prospect of Florida returned, of the Jamaica being captured from the British and given back to Spain. After all, it was only 100 years since she lost it. Didn't seem very long in Spanish terms. <laughs> and so, as you see, right from the very beginning, England was involved not only with France and you, but also with Spain and also with the Dutch. Uh, England was involved in the Mediterranean. The Gibraltar was besieged. Uh, England was involved desperately in India, where its army steadily began to lose against the French. And by 1782, 83, England had suffered a resounding defeat, not only in America, but also elsewhere. The preliminaries of peace only just saved the British position in India. Gibraltar withstood its siege by a hair's breadth. And it was only by the victory of Rodney at the Saints, the year after Yorktown, 
that it was able to reestablish her position in the West Indies and in the Caribbean. So as you see, you involved us in a global war. And, you involve, and the results, too, were of a global nature because you changed the whole nature of the British Empire, its whole focus, its whole direction. America lost. The struggle between France and Britain changed to the other side of the world. There was no longer any danger of a Mississippian empire. The battlefield moved to India and beyond. The whole axis of empire had to change after 1782. The old triangular trade of the first British Empire ceased to be of significance. After 1783, Anglo-French rivalry is in the Indian Ocean and the, and the Pacific. England has to look to the east, not only to India, where it had been putting down roots, I grant you, uh, before the American Revolution, but tentative roots. Remember, William Chatham had refused to take and accept on the part of the British government Bengal from the East India Company. Uh, the situation in India was still a very tentative one in 1782. But after 1782, India becomes the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. Increasingly, Britain takes over the ruling of the Ganges Valley. Increasingly, it plays off prince against prince and then brings them under its Susan Therian control. Increasingly, it puts the pressure on France until during the Napoleonic Wars, it's able almost to destroy French position in India totally. But that's not the end of the story. Britain was also influenced in another direction by your success. There was nowhere to send its, convict, its convicts anymore or the prostitutes which it occasionally swept from the streets of London. Georgia was denied to it. <laughs> we started, we tried just keeping the prisoners in uh, old naval hulks in the Thames, but these became such pestilential spots, uh, riddled with typhoid and cholera and fever, uh, that in the end it was decided there'd have to be a new convict settlement, and so they were dumped in Australia, which gave us one, another great dominion, but also, of course, involved us in the strategic situation of the Pacific, and also, of course, involved us in the strategic <laughs> France takes Madagascar, or there's great rivalry on the coast of East Africa between France and Britain, nor that we should both dabble in the Eastern Mediterranean. In fact, you can say the repercussions of the American independence was to create vast imperial rivalry in the East and beyond for the next hundred years. It reverberated its results for a century. But that's not all, and far from all. Remember Lafayette. Lafayette was sincerely stirred by the idea that the Americans were fighting for a new sort of freedom and a new sort of liberty. And Lafayette was not alone. He was not a sport, as they'd say in scientific terms. There were many like him. I could spend the rest of my time lecturing to you, taking you to Germany, to the Netherlands, to Latin America, even to Russia, and naming to you people who were stirred by your example, by your struggle for what seemed to be fundamental rights and liberties for ordinary men and women. And this too echoed in Britain as strongly as it e uh, echoed anywhere. Echoed particularly loudly, of course, in Ireland. Indeed, I must deal with Ireland first. It echoed so strongly in Ireland that the first clear movement for the loosening and the breaking of ties with Britain begins at this point. 
Initially, it is for loosening the ties, but out of that loosening springs the clear demand uh, for independence. Again, America was to provide, from that time onwards, support, both moral and material, uh, for the struggle of Ireland to get itself free from Britain. It was to provide uh, an asylum for terrorists and for anarchists and for Irish patriots and nationalists over the next hundred years, and indeed still does so, because that desperate situation is still unresolved. But there is no doubt that Ireland drew a great deal of sustenance and strength uh, from your example, and of course, once you gave and provided a haven for so many thousands of destitute Irish Catholic peasants in the early 19th century, uh, giving them an asylum and a hope, uh, they too, of course, provided a sort of background of moral support and sometimes of material support for Ireland in its struggle. And remember, the problem of Ireland was the greatest problem in British politics of the 19th century. And undeniably, it was a, uh, strengthened uh, by what happened over here. Again, it is important to remember that although there was not a great deal of support for you in 1776 in England, indeed, once you joined with France, it was difficult to be both patriotic and radical. And there's no doubt that the patriotism of many men overcame their radicalism and the support for America, which had been so strong at the time of the Stamp Act, certainly declined by 1776. But it began to revive again and revive very strongly from 1779 onwards. And furthermore, your success in undoubtedly strengthened the goals of radicalism in England because it was partly American publicists in Britain. We tend to forget that you had them in Britain, even in 1776, who were making it clear to the English radicals that this was a common struggle that they were involved in. As, Le as Lee and Otis pointed out, your enemies are our enemies. Your friends are our friends. You too are just as much a victim of oligarchical government and unrepresentative government as we are. Birmingham pays vast taxes. Manchester pays vast taxes. Sheffield pays vast taxes but they are not represented any more than we are in the House of Commons. There is no tax, no taxation without representation means as much in your country as it does in ours. And it's not perhaps surprising that the radical city of London should have made two Virginians sheriff in 1776. And indeed, I would maintain that the movement for the reform rather than the purification of Parliament stems uh, from the American independence, from those sympathizers of your struggle. The first clear call for universal male suffrage, for instance, occurs uh, during the struggle between America and England uh, for Englishmen. The first clear call for fundamental parliamentary reform. Now, it, made, it took to 1832 to achieve that. The French Revolution was partly responsible in checking it, just as it had been checked by the war with France at your time. Nevertheless, from that moment onwards, the movement for parliamentary reform, although periodically checked, grows and strengthens until it's achieved. And this, I think, is very important, because you had yourself achieved your independence through representative institutions. It strengthened the concept your fight and success, and then England's parliamentary reform, that representative institutions could defend liberty, could defend freedom, and could secure it, which became a powerful ideological attitude in the 19th century, and in the early 20th, leading to the formation of democratic institutions in many unlikely places in the world who since, I'm afraid and regret, have since lost them. But nevertheless, he gave an impetus, the American Revolution, to the cause of representative democracy in England and beyond. 
Now, I think it did more than this, too. I now want to come to something which is more difficult, in a sense, to quantify, more difficult to point to specific acts, specific situations. But you need to re be reminded at this particular moment in American history, because I think you don't realize quite, or at least you're beginning to forget, the role which you've played over the last 200 years. After all, you suffered your first defeat recently. Now, that's nothing new to most nations in the world. Most nations in the world, you'll be lucky if you only have it once happen to you. <laughs> most nations in the world have been defeated time and time again. Britain has been defeated several times, many times. Again, you've suffered from the exposure of corruption and perhaps for a search for almost unbridled power in the highest executive offices of your government. This again is not very surprising to a European or even to an Englishman. Remember, we once had to cut off a king's head <laughs> and had to kick another across the channel, not put them on a large pension. <laughs> and these things, I think, have bruised you too much. And then, of course, you have become sensitized, and thank God, uh, during the last 20 years, to many of the deep injustices of your society. You recall that Dr. Johnson said, how can those people prate about freedom when they keep so many in slavery? Thomas Day, an ardent Rusite and radical, felt exactly the same thing. He said he'd support American liberty from the moment they freed their slaves. You have become sensitized over the last two decades, to not only to the terrible institution of slavery, which went on for so long, but of its sad and tragic results. And therefore, when many of you and many historians, when looking back at the founding fathers, looking back even at a man like Jefferson, have felt there must be almost a streak of hypocrisy, which could speak so clearly about human rights and liberties, and at the same time maintain an institution which deprives so many people of it. So for all of these reasons, and for all of these causes, you tend to turn away, tend to forget what you stood for so clearly to many of the dispossessed, the downtrodden, and the deprived of Europe from 1780 onwards. People were inflamed by your success and by what you stood for from 1780 onwards. Take the Dutchman. Adrian van der Kemp, he wrote as follows, America can teach us to fight against the degeneration of our national character, the debasement of its soul, the corruption of its will to resist. And he said that while liberty was dying throughout Europe, in Sweden, in the Netherlands, and elsewhere, it was rekindling its vitality across the Atlantic. Again, May I read you what William Turner of Wakefield wrote to his son? His one letter to survive. Who he was, we don't know, but we know he had the right idea. Through the folly and wickedness of the present, you, the rising generation, that is his son, of course, have a dark prospect before you. That was in England. Your best way will be to gather as fast as you can a good stock of the arts and sciences of this country, namely England, and if you find, as I expect you will, the night of despotism overwhelm this hemisphere, follow the course of the sun to that country where freedom has already fixed her standards. Where freedom has already fixed her standards. And so for so many in Europe, for so many Englishmen, for even more Scotchmen and Irishmen and Welshmen, you had fixed the standard of freedom and liberty here. We forget the tyranny, the poverty, the pogroms, the killing of liberals as well as Jews in 19th century Europe. 
Hence we belittle and undervalue, I think, what America meant to so many of the persecuted, the downtrodden, uh, and the dispossessed. She offered what so few countries have ever done, liberty, equality, and the pursuit of happiness. At a distance, in the ghettos of Russia and Poland, or in the slums of Naples and the starving villages of Greece and Sicily, America glowed with hope for mankind. When the immigrants, of course, got here, and we, of course we can test that hope by the fact that they came in those frightful coffin ships where one person in five died. They're worse than slave ships. One person in five died. The worst ships were those who came from London. Shiploads, when they arrived in America and New York, quite often were too weak to work, most of them suffering from cholera and disease. No one would have made that journey. No one would have made that crossing unless something was calling them and calling loud. And what was calling them was hope. Of course, I realize as well as anybody else that when they got here, reality was much harsher. It was easy to starve to death on the Lower East Side. It was easy, perhaps easier, not to make it than to make it. To get into a life of grinding, never-ending poverty, not only for you but for your children. Quality and happiness, too, were often elusive. Nevertheless, no other country has given so much hope to so many of mankind or opened its doors to such a flood of the, war, of the world's poor and downtrodden. And this, I think, would never have happened had the control of your society continued in the hands of the hierarchical social structure of a country like England. It needed the Bill of Rights. It needed the sense of civic and social equality, which was certainly maintained among the whites, at least, uh, during that period. And I think this could have only been made possible, as I said, by the American Revolution. In the end, it was the spirit of Lafayette, the spirit of Jonathan Chipley, the spirit of Adrian van der Kemp that prevailed. Men of goodwill, men of social hope, men who have faith in the capacities of mankind are not always defeated. And now, in your somewhat bruised condition, I think you should remember that. You're still a very great country of very great potentialities in spite of Vietnam and certainly in spite of one rather insignificant president. would be pleased to ask, answer questions if you have them. Yes, I think we can. I think it's difficult to, uh, uh, to pin it entirely to the fact that America had uh, achieved its freedom and indeed uh, stated what it thought the rights of men should be because there had been a considerable uh, criticism of and discussion of the oligarchical nature of British society before then. But I would maintain certainly that that movement was strengthened uh, and also it began to sink deeper into the population. And remember that the man who uh, had been so successful in rousing you, uh, namely Tom Paine, did come back and uh, produce the rights of men, uh, which many people deplored that coal miners were reading, even by the aid of a candle, in the depths of the coal mine in Britain. And the rights of men began to penetrate to a much lower level of society than say in the earlier part of the century. Uh, 
But Burke, um, Burke, I think, is an extremely complex figure. Uh, a man uh, very sensitive. Um, something I regret, I think, well, here I'm sticking out my neck because I know that he's something of a cult in certain circles now. I think he was something of a, an opportunist, in, but in a subconscious sort of way. Uh, and remember that he was trying to give, in the time of the American Revolt, a coherent policy to the Rockingham Whigs. And also he had got certain sympathies with the downtrodden and those, as it were, who had been made into second-class citizens through his Irishness and his sympathy with Catholics and his relationship to Catholics. He was one of the few public people in 18th century England to come out in defense of a homosexual sentenced to be hanged. Uh, there was a liberal streak, undoubtedly, in Burke. On the other hand, you've got this almost, to me, insane reverence of the aristocracy, you know, the great oaks of natural authority. Well, if you look at some of them, they may be oaks, but they were made of very curious materials. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I think he was made a bit paranoid by by the French Revolution and by the destruction of the aristocracy there. But he is a very complex figure. Yes? I don't think 